Hey there everyone, Mr. Lewis here again, ready to go through section 7.5 in AP Hug today, which is called The Green Wave. But before we dive into The Green Wave, I want to discuss your Unit 7 test a little bit. So the Unit 7 test will be two parts, one multiple choice, one free response. But instead of doing them on the same day, you're going to do them on separate days. So the multiple choice portion will take place next Thursday, one week from today, March 18th. That's the multiple choice section. The free response section is going to take place the following day, next Friday, March 19th. So two separate sections on two separate days. We're going to wrap up with all Unit 7 content and notes today and tomorrow. There's only two sections left. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be entirely dedicated to getting you ready for the Unit 7 test. So to that end... Let's review the notes in section 7.5. The green wave is all about agricultural revolutions and innovations that have taken place throughout world history. So let's take a look. Okay, section 7.5, the green wave. And in this section, the green wave of our unit over agricultural geography, we are going to look at everything from very early hearths or the origins of farming and plant and animal domestication all the way up through today's agricultural systems. So we start way back in the day in some of these very early agricultural hearths. And as you've learned up to this point in the course, we've discussed this uh, in many different contexts, a hearth is simply an origin location, right? A uh, particular region where something started. Sometimes it can be as specific as a town or a city. In these cases, we're looking at general regions, and here's why. Much of these, many of these early agricultural hearths are the result of bodies of water, and those bodies of water are expansive, right? So as we look across the world at some of the major early agricultural uh, civilizations, we can see in the Americas, Central America, or what was known as Mesoamerica, uh, Latin America, was domesticating the land very, very early on. Anything you see written in red here means that those crops were planted over 9,000 years ago. So in Mesoamerica, in Central America, we see squash being grown over 9,000 years ago. Peppers. 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. And then, of course, a bunch of other good stuff, right? Sweet potatoes, potatoes, maize, beans, stuff like that. Uh, some other major hearths here as we look over into the Eastern Hemisphere, Sub-Saharan Africa, stuff like yams, sorghum in uh, Southwest Asia or the Middle East. This is one of the primary early agricultural hearths, as we discussed earlier in the unit. This is the Fertile Crescent. This is ancient Mesopotamia, where things like barley and wheat and oats and rye were grown over 9,000 years ago. This is often attributed as the earliest hearth of uh, domestication of the land or agriculture. And then over here in East Asia, uh, we see very early uh, rice farming, right, over 9,000 years ago. And uh, um, a lot of rice still grown in that region of the world today. It's, it's one of the primary uh, agricultural sectors in East Asia. And then finally in Southeast Asia, we get some more fun stuff like mango, coconuts, what have you. But these are some of the major early agricultural hearts. One more that I want to point out because it is important is the Indus Valley. The Indus Valley was in India or is in India. And it was one of the, uh, not just the first agricultural hearths, but one of the first major civilizations in the world down here. Now, how do we get from there to where we are now? One step at a time. First comes the agricultural revolution. This is what's known as the Neolithic revolution, or the first agricultural revolution. It was the first time we see the domestication of the land, or practicing uh, agriculture, um, practices in agriculture actually uh, taking place on a widespread scale. So whoever the first ones were, others caught on fast and realized what a great thing this was 
to be able to domesticate the land, um, let the land literally feed you, right, and sustain not just your life but your family's life, right, and and the people around you's lives um, with the earth, with with plants and and uh, uh, what they give you. So this this idea, of course, was very very big and very popular, and through diffusion mostly relocation diffusion, these practices were passed along. And then we get the Columbian Exchange. So moving forward many, many, many centuries here, okay, thousands of years, we get into the uh, 15th century when we have a lot of exploration going back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean here, right? Uh, the Columbian Exchange, named after Christopher Columbus, saw all kinds of goods brought from the Americas to Europe, Africa, Asia, and then, of course, many goods brought back to the Americas. So coming from the Americas were things like pumpkins, tobacco, turkeys, sweet potatoes, pineapples, peanuts, all kinds of good stuff. And then coming back to the Americas from Europe, Africa, and Asia were things like onions, citrus fruits, grapes, bananas, sugarcane, right? Peaches, all kinds of new stuff, but also many grains, livestock, additionally viruses and, and diseases, things like smallpox, influenza, that people in the Americas would not have any kind of immunity built up to, right? So, so there was some good with this, but there was also some bad with this. And, and we've discussed uh, some of the positives and negatives of these early um, exchange routes, these early trade routes uh, before in this course. So from the Colombian exchange, right, from all these goods going from the Americas over to Europe and Africa and Asia and then back to the Americas from those locations, through this exchange there are all kinds of new plants and animals that are being domesticated across the world. But that's in the 15th and 16th century, right? And as we get into the 17th century, so now we're in the 1600s, the second agricultural revolution comes about. There are two main factors that contribute to the second agricultural revolution. One is crop rotation. Not growing the same things over and over and over and over, but growing different crops and letting the land sit fallow at times, meaning letting it sit unplanted to sort of recoup and regenerate its nutrients, right? To become more fertile soil. That's what we call uh, fallow, letting the land sit fallow. Well, crop rotation is a very effective method. And also, with the advent of crop rotation, we see new technology coming out, new farming technology, new plows. A new plow makes it much easier to farm uh, greater plots of land with fewer laborers, right? Fewer farmers. So it leads to really being uh, able to farm more extensively, which leads to better diets because there's a greater food supply, more consistent food supply, longer lives, more people, a greater population, and because less workers are needed to actually farm the land, now we have more workers and specifically a surplus of workers, more unemployed workers. This draws many of these workers eventually who are looking for better income, or looking for a job in general, or looking for new opportunities. This is a time of great change, especially over in uh, England, right, where the Industrial Revolution is going to take place very soon. These workers are going to come in handy. We're going to see all of these additional workers flood to the factories, and uh, in those factories, they're going to find a lot of jobs because this industrial revolution is coming about. So the second agricultural revolution helps lead to the industrial revolution through these uh, effects here and, and causes, right? They're both effects of the second agricultural revolution and causes of the industrial revolution. Finally, we get closer to today, okay, up through today, and really starting in the 1960s, we've seen the Green Revolution, also referred to as the Third Agricultural Revolution, taking place with high-yield seeds, increased use of chemicals, and new technology in general, specifically, though, 
with machinery, right? Mechanized farming and, and a lot of it uh, automation in today's day and age. But there are positives and negatives to all of this. The positives are we have huge crop yields, these massive yields, which leads to massive profits for, for companies and for, for uh, big time farmers and uh, a lot of automated operations. So it takes some of that hard labor off the shoulders of some of those farmers, right? Um, some other positives, we have seeds and plants that are resistant to pests and pesticides and herbicides and, and we can basically grow anything anywhere almost, right? Within, uh, uh, within a margin, uh, meaning we can set up these um, indoor facilities that grow, say, strawberries or grapes where maybe they otherwise wouldn't grow so well. So we've developed all kinds of incredible innovative technology within the agricultural industry. Some negatives of these recent developments in agriculture, one is monoculturing. A lot of big time uh, agribusinesses, farming corporations, agricultural corporations, make use of monoculturing. And what that does is it uses the same seed to grow the same plant year after year after year. This compromises diversity and biodiversity and agricultural diversity, and it compromises uh, crop health. And also, we've talked about crop rotation, right? This is the opposite of that. When we're, we're practicing monoculturing, growing the same thing over and over year after year. And uh, this can erode the soil. It can uh, damage crop health and, and uh, uh, the uh, soil health as well. GMO seeds which means genetically modified organisms, are high-yield seeds. They produce incredibly uh, large crop yields, but they're quite expensive. So for small-time farmers, it's tough to keep up, right, when these seeds are so expensive, and those seeds go sterile. So it used to be where farmers could use seeds from one year to replant the next, right? But these seeds go, go sterile because the company makes them that way. They genetically modify them, not just to be resistant to pesticides and herbicides and to get uh, these, these, these incredibly high yields, but also to go sterile. That way, you got to buy more seeds from them the next year, right? So it's brilliant in terms of business and, and making a lot of profit, but for some of those small-time farmers, it's, it's tough. Uh, and this can lead to shortages of certain crops. Even though we have surpluses of some crops, it can lead to shortages of others because we're monoculturing, right? Because we're only focusing on certain items, it may lead to a shortage of other items. And, and as I mentioned, uh, in some cases, environmental damage, whether it's through the crop health itself or the, the health of the soil or through deforestation in some examples, right? Where agribusiness uh, just gets to be too big and the mission to uh, earn greater profits becomes so driven that uh, we, we knock down forest land to make room for more cropland and more farmland. So, so that's another example of um, how environmental damage could occur. So there are positives to all of this, but we also have to consider the negatives. And you may be asked about uh, either one of those or both on the Unit 7 test or uh, on the AP exam. So we have to know the good and the bad. And to go over a little bit of the good and the bad, I'm gonna ask that you watch the first half of this video today. It's called Save Your Seeds is the, the name of the story. And you can see there's, there's two stories here. There's Save Your Seeds and then there's India's water crisis. We're not gonna talk about India's water crisis today. I just would like you to watch the first half of this. You can start at about 1.10 in the video and it finishes at about 16.50. So it's about 15 minutes long and uh, I'll let you watch that on your own. I won't sit here and, and uh, make you watch the recording of the video. It's in Buzz, you can, you can check it out for yourself. But it's a really interesting examination of GMO seeds and the positives and the negatives. And, and you hear interviews with the CEO and the chief technology officer of one of the, the big, big, big uh, agribusiness corporations in the world called Monsanto. And, you know, they, they um, stake their claim for 
why GMOs are a positive thing and, and, and how they're helping the world, but then you also hear the negative side of it too. So I'll let you weigh those out for yourself and come to your own opinion. And uh, as you're doing that, if you could, please answer the 10 questions in the buzz activity called Save Your Seeds video. And you'll see there are, there are 10 multiple choice questions. They go in order with the video so you can watch the video and keep an eye on those questions as you do so and answer them as you go. All right. Thank you so much. That is it for me today. Um, tomorrow, we will finish up with Unit 7 with the very last section, Section 6, looking at today's agriculture. All right. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, and I will see you then to wrap up with Unit 7. Our Unit 7 test will take place next Thursday and Friday. Okay, Thursday of next week will be the multiple choice test, and then Friday of next week will be the FRQ. But we have all of next week to review. Let's just focus on wrapping up Unit 7 first, and then we'll crush that test next week. All right. So long, everyone.